Okay, not being the master of PowerPoint, I don't have all the points up on the screen. So if you want to have pen and paper, you're certainly welcome to do that. I'm going to go through a lot of scriptures in the time we have because the scripture is so full of pictures of the family. And we'll talk about those. We'll talk also about uh, families of divorce. We'll talk about families with adoption. We'll talk about a lot of different aspects of family today. But we're going to use as our primary text uh, Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 22, down through the beginning of chapter 6. Now let me point out that there are a lot of families, and families sometimes get hurt. There's a lot of hurt in some families. And nationally, there's a huge increase in family dysfunction across our country. The practical results are this. According to Eric Metaxas, just, just to pick one aspect of family relationship, according to Eric Metaxas, 63% of teen suicides are from fatherless homes. 90% of homeless children and runaways are from fatherless homes. 71% of all high school dropouts are from fatherless homes. Now, those problems can occur in any family, but just looking at one strained relationship, an absent father gives you a picture of how important family structure is. So we're going to look at family. Family is also very, very important to God. It pictures Him and His relationships, as we saw today in the children's corner. Let me point out, too, that in every case in the Old Testament law where God calls for capital punishment, it is either related to the sanctity of Himself and His worship such as idolatry, blasphemy, worship on the Sabbath day, taking that as a special day aside, or it is something that tears at the family. Kidnapping, murder, obviously tear at the structure of the family by removing a member of the family. But also laws about adultery, laws about cursing of parents. Those could be capital crimes under the Old Testament law. Interesting, the two things that God puts up there as categories for capital crime, worship of Him and failure in the family in certain modes. The issue is huge. I'm going to try and fly through it quickly. No family is perfect, and that certainly, certainly includes mine, but this is such an important issue that this is required of every one of the elders at Trinity and in other churches that follow Scripture. 1 Timothy 3, verses 4 and 5. Each elder, quote, must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take charge of the church of God? So to do this, we're going to talk about what we find in Ephesians. I want to very quickly rush through the context Ephesians is an incredible book of the Bible. It's broken really into two halves. The first half is doctrine. And the doctrine, interestingly, is all about in Him. Bob spoke a couple of weeks ago about what it means to be in Christ. The whole first half of the book of Ephesians, you find again and again, preposition, Him. Preposition, Christ. It's in Him, through Him, by Him or in Christ, through Christ, by Christ. Again and again, that occurs in the first part of the book of Ephesians. And after that, comes the doctr uh, after the doctrinal part of the book, comes the practical application, where Paul talks again and again about what to do. Let me just highlight two verses. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For you are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. There's that phrase, in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God has prepared beforehand for you to walk in them. And then again, looking a little bit farther on, we find the picture of the family starting to emerge in a powerful way. The second half of Ephesians chapter 4 through 6, I want to highlight Ephesians 5.1, which says, Be imitators of God as dear children. 
And then it talks about the contrasting families, the children of disobedience. This is in Ephesians 5, 6 through 8, the children of disobedience and the children of God. Paul contrasts these families and then goes on to talk about what the Holy Spirit does when he's at work in our lives, including giving us joy, giving us music in our hearts, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, expressing thanks to God the Father in the name of Christ Jesus, submitting to one another. Now that verse, submitting to one another, leads us right into the passage we're talking about today. He talks about submitting to one another. And if you look at James chapter 4, verses 6 through 10, you'll see there's an interlock between submission and humility. It's very hard, if not impossible, to submit. If you're proud, independent, submission demands a degree of humility to rank yourself under somebody else. That humility is exemplified by Jesus Christ. We read about it in, in Philippians, how Christ humbled himself and took on himself the form of a servant. Church leaders are forbidden to lord it over others. That's in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 3. We read in Philippians, I already said that about Christ and about how he is the perfect example of taking on himself humility. Now, starting in verse 22, Paul counsels wives also to take this humble attitude. And he calls them to submit to their husband's leadership. Now, he addresses the ladies first. Don't worry. He addresses the issues to men as well about being humble. And in fact, calling men to go beyond humility to self-sacrifice. We'll talk about that in a moment. First, uh, just real quickly, Ephesians 5, 22 through 33 the husband and wife are a picture of Christ and the church. So the relationship between the man and woman in marriage is absolutely essential. Submission, I want to just mention how this is used in 1 Peter chapter 3. The virtual same words as we find in Ephesians chapter 5 are echoed in 1 Peter chapter 3. That helps us know that this is not just an isolated passage. Never should we skip over any word of Scripture. But this principle is reiterated in other Scriptures, and in this case reiterated by a different apostle. Peter saying in chapter 3 something very similar to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5. The idea, the basis for this goes all the way back to Genesis according to 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 11 through 15. That history back in Genesis is something that Paul refers to in the upcoming verses and that's something I want to make mention of. It all goes back to Genesis, to what happened in the garden, the relationships that were set there and the sin that took place there. Adam was our team captain, if you will. And he called it wrong. There in the garden, when offered the choice, he was not deceived. Uh, Eve actually was deceived. Adam chose sin. And as our team captain, so to speak, he chose it on behalf of all of us. As a result, there is sin and death that we all have to face. In society, we have ills and problems because of that sin. God seems less interested in reforming the societies of this passing world than in changing his people within it. And he calls for submission as a part of this change. Submission requires humility. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. So this is, this is a difficult thing that God should teach us Humility. Our natural bent, our natural desire is first of all to be independent and second of all to lord it over others, to control others. It's not just enough that we want to control our own destiny. We want to influence others. We want to take charge of others. It's natural. It's an inborn bent. 
goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. But God is the only one who can offer us salvation and rescue from our problem and from our situation. And then He calls us to learn humility and to submit. 1 Peter 3.1 even suggests that submission to the husband by the wife silently can be used to win a wayward husband. You look at other scriptures and you find the call not to end slavery, but for slaves to submit to their masters. The modern application for employers to sub, excuse me, employees to submit to their employers. Submission to the structures that God has instituted, including government. I've mentioned it before. I have a hard time sometimes keeping my car at the right speed. But that is a divine instruction because government is instituted by God Himself. Now, if the verses about submission are abused, misused, it can be very destructive to the family. This is in the context of a picture of Christ and the church. Why does Christ have the church in submission? It's not that Christ is an ogre or evil. The church submits to Christ out of love. He has given Himself for us. And that is how it needs to be in marriage. We very quickly come to the verses that talk about the husband's role in marriage. And the husband's role in marriage is a sacrificial role. Men, love is absolutely essential if you want the picture of the family, of your family, of my family. If we want it to be a picture of Christ and the church as it should be, love must be a part of it. And this love prevents abuse of the principle of submission and this love is the basis for what we do. The word love occurs in verse 25 twice. It occurs in verse 28 three times. It's again in verse 33 in the summary of the husband's responsibilities. And there is an absolutely unavoidable parallel structure. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. Men, if you want to know how to love your wife, the difficult standard, the impossible standard is the standard that Christ has. The love He has given for us, giving His own life, that is the standard we have. In case we don't get it, we can look at verse 28, where loving our wives has to become as basic as loving ourselves. There, there are so many overlapping truths here. First of all, healthy men don't try and hurt themselves. The implication is if we want to ill-treat our wives, we are harming our own self-interest. At the lowest, most basic, primal level, we can understand that. Happy wife, happy husband. Okay? Number two, at another level, this verse talks about not hating our own flesh. It foreshadows the words in verse 31, which echo the familiar words from Genesis. The two become one flesh. First of all, that means, men, remember, your wife is made of the same stuff as you are. Literally, Eve taken from the side of man. Women, wives, they have the same feelings, same needs, sometimes even more intense, the same weaknesses, the same hopes, so be considerate of your wife. Going further down this road, there are many ways in which a husband and wife become one flesh. One way is physically, so cherish her the way you want to be cherished. Another interlocking truth with this is when two people unite physically, there's an inexplicable spiritual union. 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 20 makes it clear that any sort of physical union, marital or not, results in a spiritual union. But when it takes place as God plans in the context of marriage, it's an act of worship. It's a spiritual as well as a physical union. Next, one way we can understand this verse about the two becoming one flesh is to think about what happens on a basic chromosomal level when a new baby is conceived. Half husband, half wife, taking from both. 
the two become one flesh. A man and woman having a child. Cherishing your own flesh and blood in this context that we read here in Ephesians chapter 5 can also mean caring for your children. When we love our wives, we have to bless our children. And when we dissimilate, it hurts our own offspring. Listen to what this says. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her that He might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the Word. And by the way, I want to go in that because that's a whole, that's a whole sermon in itself and I'm going to have to, to skip briefly through that because of the time constraints. The washing of water by the Word that He might present her to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. Doesn't that echo the words of Genesis? Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, and then Paul lays out what we talked about at the very beginning. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. When he talks about husband and wife, he's talking about Christ and the church. It's a symbol, it's a picture, and you cannot escape it. So, men, women, how good is your family picture? If you had a family portrait taken and you have it hanging somewhere in the house, you probably remember it. it took a little bit of time, a little bit of preparation, probably some effort went into picking the clothes, getting the hair just right, getting everything laid out. And then you go and you spend some money probably and have that photograph taken. It's a picture of your family. God has made the family to be a picture of Himself. God is infinite and we cannot understand Him. There is no way we can grasp the essence of God. So He's given us pictures and symbols like the shepherd, like the vine dresser, like so many other pictures in the Bible. People can't relate to all of those pictures if they haven't seen sheep or they don't know about vineyards. But every person it is instituted in the physical laws of this world Every person has to have a father and a mother. It's biological. And the best picture he has for the relationship between us and God is a father-son relationship. The best picture he has for the relationship between the church and Christ is that picture of the wife and the husband and the love they have one for another. Let me go back to Genesis very briefly. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 just after talk about flesh of flesh and bone of bone. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. I shouldn't have to point it out, but I will, because it's important in today's society. First of all, this is a binary proposition. God created them male and female, if we read through Genesis. There's not a transitional form. Second, He talks about man and woman. Just saying that's how it's described in the book of Genesis and that's how it was instituted and that's the only way that the family reproduces. It's the only natural way. Secondly, God in Genesis talks about being fruitful. That means reproductive. Family relationship is to be fruitful and multiply. By the way, There are spiritual applications of that too. We are to spiritually reproduce. But I'm not going there. That's another sermon. It is monogamous. God gave Adam one wife, Eve. It is of the same type, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and yet distinct in roles. It is blessed by God, given dominance over creation. Marriage was instituted before the fall. Government came after the fall. All these other human institutions we see come after the fall. But the family was instituted before Adam sinned. It is unique and special.
Husbands, how can you have a better picture of Christ in your home? Number one, give yourself. Give yourself physically to your wife. That certainly applies to physical union, 1 Corinthians 7, 5. But it also applies to working for your wife. Bodily labor. <laughs> Give yourself physically. Do you have a honeydew list? I do. I still have a few things on it. Give yourself physically. Give yourself mentally to your wife. Do you think about what she needs? Give yourself financially to your wife. First Corinth, excuse me, First Timothy five eight says that the, the, the husband, the man who does not provide for his family is worse than a heathen or an infidel. Give yourself socially to your wife. Spend time together. Husbands, date your wives. That's important. Some of the men in this church will encourage the other men to go and do that. It's a good thing. Give yourself emotionally to your wife. That means ask her how she's doing and actually listen. Actively listen. Those are just a few comments aside from the text. But going back to the text, what happens here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, and what is echoed by Paul in Ephesians 5, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, they shall become one flesh, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Let me point out a pastor I used to have years ago, a fellow by the name of Tom Hovestall, said that means you leave, you cleave, you weave, and I'm going to add, you perceive. You leave, we cleave, weave, and perceive. You leave father and mother. That relationship is not finished. You're still called to honor your father and mother. But you have a new relationship that supersedes it, so you leave. You cleave. You become uniquely connected to that one person, not letting anyone else into that relationship. There are other relationships, but that one is sacred, the marital relationship. So you cleave. You weave. You become one flesh. We've already talked about that. And you perceive the husband and wife were both naked and not ashamed. They saw everything. There was no shame. We need to be open, transparent. I'm not talking physically. I'm talking about spiritually, emotionally. We need to be open one to another to communicate so we can perceive. In fact, when we take a look at 1 Peter 3, 7, it says, Your husbands in the same way live with your wives in an understanding way. And a little later in the verse it says, So your prayers will not be hindered. If we can't communicate with our wives in this open, understanding way, how can we communicate with God? Men, you want a more effective prayer life? <laughs> Understand your wife. That's kind of a, an unforeseen conclusion, something that, that you don't imagine when you get married. But if you have a blockage in your relationship with your wife, because that is a picture of our relationship with Christ, you cannot have an effective prayer life. Work it through. Get it over with. Resolve the issue. Because the issue will hinder your prayers. I want us to take a look also at the last part, Ephesians 5.32, the last part of this connection between husband and wife. Not only are we explicitly told that this is a picture of Christ in the church, that this is a mystery, but we're told that there needs to be love and respect. Now, a whole book could be written on it, and in fact, at least one has. Emerson Egerich wrote a book called Love and Respect, and he points out that in surveys, they find that the thing that men most need from their wives is respect. The thing that women most need from their husbands is love. And he warns about what he calls the crazy cycle, which can happen if the husband doesn't 
doesn't love his wife as Christ loved the church, if he's not loving his wife real well and the wife doesn't feel the love, then she may not respect him so much and not give him so much respect. And then he in turn says, I'm getting disgusted with you. His love diminishes, his love diminishes, her respect diminishes, her respect diminishes, and it snowballs. It's a crazy cycle. It is something we need to watch for because here in Scripture we're told that there needs to be this. Nevertheless, let each of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Practically, women, sometimes let your husband take the lead. He may not even be pointing in the right direction. Women, when he's not pointing in the right direction, appeal lovingly to him. Do you remember what Esther did when King Ahasuerus was going in the wrong direction? She invited him, her husband, to a banquet. She treated him, not just once, but twice. And then she brought up the issue. Wives, appeal to your husband. Husbands, sacrifice for your wife. Again, it's the idea that Christ sacrificed for the church. We sacrifice a lot when we are courting, trying to get the woman in whom we're interested. Don't let it stop there. Don't let it stop there. Continue to sacrifice for her to keep your love strong. And if you have let your love fade, look at the words that we find, the words of Christ in Revelation 2, verses 5 and 6. He's talking to the church there, which of course is a picture of the relationship. And the relationship between Christ and the church is a picture of the relationship between husband and wife. And he says in uh, Revelation 2, 5 and 6, Remember the high point from which you have fallen. Change your hearts and lives and do the things you did at first. So if your marital relationship is weakening, men, if you're losing that first love, think back. Remember what you did at first. Remember how you dated and courted. Remember how you won her and wooed her. And do the things again that you did at first. What is it she specially likes? <laughs> what is it that, that wins her? Make that important. Take time to do that. Win her. And finally, the litmus test, men and women. If there's a strain in that relationship, resolve it and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's the love chapter. Read 1 Corinthians 13. Can you put your name in there? Not just love is patient, love is kind, but Dan is patient, Dan is kind. Is that how you relate to your husband or wife? Children, if you're here, your relationship is a different type of picture, but it's also a picture of a holy, divine relationship. The relationship between father and son is particularly pictured in Scripture. That does not mean that daughters and mothers are unimportant, but it means that this is the best analogy or the best picture we have to help us understand what our relationship to God is like. And when God speaks, we need to obey. Children, obey your parents. And the verse doesn't just stop there. It doesn't just say, children, obey your parents. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. That means that when you obey, your obedience is a symbol. It's a picture. Just as Christ obeyed God. Do you remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed? He did not want to be crucified. It was painful. He said, nevertheless, not your will but mine. Jesus said, okay, I'm not going to do it my way. Your way. I'm going to do it your way. Children, when your parents instruct you, listen to the instruction of your parents. Heed it. Obey your parents and do it in the Lord. This also means you can ask God for help. You're doing this in the Lord. The ultimate bottom line, your responsibility is not just to your parent. It's to God. 
Then it talks about honoring your parents. John MacArthur makes the distinction between honoring and obey. It's the difference between action and attitude. Obedience is when you do. Honoring is the attitude that you have. Malachi 1.6 talks about this. A son honors his father and a servant honors his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence? Malachi was talking to a country that was coming apart at the seams. And he said, have you got the picture in your home? Have you learned to honor your father, children? If so, give me the honor. It's a picture. Your behavior, children, either brings honor to your father and mother or disgrace. Proverbs 10.1 reads, A wise son makes a father glad. A foolish son is a grief to his mother. Honor must not evaporate when your parents are not there to watch you. Don't forget the example of Daniel. Taken away from his parents, taken to a foreign land, and still he chose to obey God's laws that his parents had taught him. Still he chose to do what is right. Kids, that's a heavy burden, but there's a great benefit. You know what the benefit is? Long life. Not just kids. Okay, adults too. If you're, if you're an adult and your parents are still alive, honor your father and mother. You may be living outside the home. You may be married. Obedience is not an issue as such, but honoring them is. Here at this church, uh, many of you know the Kingries. Mrs. Daniel, the mother of Cheryl Kingry, has lived with them for a number of years. And they have blessed and blessed and blessed her and cared for her and loved her. Honor your father and mother. So husbands... There's special instruction to you if you become a father. Don't provoke your children to anger. That means your expectations need to be managed. First of all, make sure the way that you treat your children is age appropriate. Reasonable expectations. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 talks about how there's a time for everything. 1 Corinthians 13, 11, When I was a child, I thought as a child, I spake as a child, I reasoned as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. Don't expect your kids to do something that is beyond their capacity. That will frustrate them. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God has promised that He won't tempt us above what we are able. <laughs> Same principle applies father to child, parent to child. Don't expect more than they are able to. Don't provoke means age appropriate. Don't provoke means constructive expectations, not too much teasing that will frustrate. James 1.13, God does not tempt us. Also, don't provoke means parents should control self before controlling the child. I just appeal to the whole book of Proverbs on that one. Adoptive families, I want to make a special note. Your relationship with your children is specially mentioned in Scripture because it is a particular picture of what God has done, taking us who were enemies and estranged and far from Him and bringing us in and making us His children. Romans 8.15, You did not receive a spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. Do you know what Abba means? It means Daddy. The translators couldn't even bring themselves to write down daddy. They thought it was too familiar, too casual, too intimate with God. But that's what it is. Ephesians 1.15, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Christ Jesus. Out of the whole universe, God chose you, predestined you to be one of his own. When you adopt a child, it's doing much the same thing. They may or may not be of age to agree to the adoption, but you take the child and you say, I predestined you, I've picked you, I've chosen you out of everyone to be my own. 
John 1, 12. You probably learned that verse when you were a kid. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. John loves this. In John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. Galatians 4, 5. There are other scriptures that deal with this idea. Single adults. Family issues still apply to you. Whether you're living under your parents' roof or not, that issue of honoring father and mother is essential. The Pharisees tried to get around it. They said, um, you know, some of our parents are getting old enough. They need our help and support. <clears throat> We're going to give things to God instead. They called it Corban. When Jesus got hold of that, he ripped into them. You can read about it in God's Word. Uh, this issue of Corban... By the way, I didn't get married until I was 36. I had a lot of years of learning to honor my father and mother. And you know what? It was a wonderful, special time of extra ministry. 1 Corinthians 7, 32 through 35 talks about how the single person is uniquely gifted. Not in ministering to family as in wife, husband, children, but gifted as in ministering to the family of God. You still have a family role to fulfill if you are a single adult. And we are glad you're here at Trinity and exercising those spiritual gifts. Practically, parents, what can you do? What should you do? This is a real quick wrap-up. Number one, teach your children. Deuteronomy chapter 6 makes it clear parents are responsible for teaching their children. It's particularly talking about teaching your children about God. But let me say, just an example, the other day I came out I was getting ready to go to work and I saw a cicada, you know, one of those insects that has a shell and it was emerging from its shell. And I, I called the kids outside and I showed them this and I talked about new life like a metamorphosis and how important it is that we have new life in Christ. It's true. Parents, when you lie down, when you rise up, when you sit down to eat, teach your kids. It's your responsibility. Number two, reprove your children. Reprove your children. That means put them on the right track. And by the way, this is not just for little children. This is for adult children as well. Take a look at 1 Kings 1, 6, where David the king nearly loses his throne to his son Adonijah, and it says that he never corrected him. Take a look at the story of Eli, found in 1 Samuel 3:13. This is what God does. Hebrews 12, 6 and 7. Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. He scourges every son he receives. What son is there whom his father does not discipline? And go back and look at verse 11 of that same chapter and you'll see it's not to inflict pain, but to produce the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Teach, reprove, bless. Parents, you can bless your children or you can curse your children. You hear about generational curses, they're real. They're in the scripture. But not just that. The words you say, do you remember how Jesus took the little children in his arms and blessed them? I remember hearing a mother call her son a bad name. She was frustrated with him. What a terrible legacy. That's going to stick in his mind for the rest of his life. And it may become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Noah cursed one of his sons. Now the son did evil. He may have deserved that curse. But let me tell you, when you bless your children or curse your children, it has a lifelong impact. You remember Jacob in the Bible? He wanted the blessing. Now he even cheated to get it. That's not what I'm advocating. <laughs> But he sought blessing again and again. And finally, God came to him and he wrestled with God, the angel of the Lord. And he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. We all need that blessing. Parents, bless your children. Number four and finally, love your children. That's the thread that weaves through all of this. That's what holds the husband-wife relationship together. And that's what is also 
in the parent-child relationship. Again, 1 John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we could be called children of God. John 3, 16 even speaks of that love. God's command to love is at the heart of the family. Do you remember the rhetorical question in other family relationship? Uh, 1 John 4, 20 and 21, How can you say you love God if you hate your brother? Love has to be at the heart of each family relationship. Now, what about divorce? In this real world, this fallen world, this imperfect world, there is divorce. God says He hates divorce and the treachery that it represents, but He instead wants families that will raise up godly offspring. If you are divorced, though, do not think for an instant that God has forgotten you, ignored you. Do not think for an instant He doesn't care or love you. Do you remember Jesus talking to the woman at the well? She'd been married five times. He didn't go and say, get away from me, you wicked woman. He drew her to herself. He talked about the sort of relationship that only he could give her, that she really needed, not the relationship with all those men. She was living with someone at the time, and Jesus loved her and sought her and was not put off at all by that. Families can be even more confused than that. Do you remember the story of Hagar and Ishmael? Think about that crazy relationship. Abraham's wife, Sarah, suggested the tryst. And then later on became disgusted and said, I want that woman out of here and her son after she herself, Sarah, had had a child. God did not forget Hagar. He met her in the wilderness. She was fearing that she would lose her life. Run out of water, fleeing through the desert with her son. And God sent an angel to console her, to help her and the boy and save their lives. Now God has established firm rules for healthy families. So how good a portrait is your family, is my family? If you can't do all of this stuff, don't worry. None of us can. But do ask God. Do check. Do use 1 Corinthians 13 as the test and ask God to strengthen the family. It's His picture. It's His picture. And He wants us to end up being a picture-perfect family. One last note, if you are not a part of the family of God, if you are here today and you realize you don't have that relationship, you can't call God Father, He has made provision to bring you into His family. I've alluded to it several times. As many as received Him, to them gave He the right to be called children of God. Receive Him. Believe Him. He has made the provision. Jesus Christ, Son of God, has come and died for me and for you. He's the only one who was sinless because each of us are sinners. And when He died, the perfect man, He paid for our sin and our imperfection, our sin, our evil. He paid it all. And if we believe, and if we receive Him, turning to Him away from our sin, we can be called children of God. And if you've never asked Him to be your Father, telling Him that you can't do it on your own, you can do it today. Mm -hmm.